John Duncan might be one of the most far-reaching artists to ever live. He painted in fairy tales, creating very vivid pagan imagery mixed with the soft pastel colors and decadent late 19th century style, more lush and art nouveau. His artwork was rooted in the Celtic revival and the pre-Raphaelite and symbolist traditions, but he also was inspired by older art movements such as the Italian Renaissance and the medieval Irish manuscripts. He worked predominantly in tempera, deliberately mimicking the styles and techniques of the creators of the Renaissance and the Irish manuscripts. What was the Celtic Revival? Well, as the 19th century was drawing to a close, visionary artists, musicians, and writers in the Celtic nations were inspired by their native art, myth, and folklore to create a new and exhilarating international movement, known by many different names, the Celtic Twilight, the Celtic Renaissance, or the Celtic Revival. Scotland had its own cultural flowering, with artists, composers, poets, Gaelic scholars, and folklore collectors throughout the country rediscovering and recreating Scotland's Celtic heritage. John Duncan experimented a lot with different techniques and styles, and his work has a mystical, otherworldly quality. He claimed to hear fairy music when he painted, which is exactly how I feel when I stare at his paintings. Duncan was definitely an eccentric personality, marrying a girl who claimed to have found the Holy Grail in a well at Glastonbury, but sadly the marriage didn't last. In terms of his subject matter, Duncan loved to depict Arthurian legends, Celtic folklore, and other mythological subjects. His thematic inspiration was closely associated with the Pre-Raphaelite movement, but still he's generally referred to as a symbolist. Symbolism was a late 19th century art movement that originated in French and Belgian poetry. Its aim was to represent absolute truth symbolically through metaphorical images. Symbolism was also reacting against other currents in the culture of the late 19th century, such as naturalism and realism, and was more broadly a movement fighting against the downstream effects in culture from the Industrial Revolution and its resulting materialism. In symbolism, there was no consistent style, but rather an appeal to the idea of the artist as a mystic or visionary, and the desire to express a world beyond superficial appearances. Returning to the personal expressiveness advocated by the Romantics earlier in that century, these artists felt that the symbolic value or meaning of a work of art came from the recreation of emotions in the viewer, through color, line, and composition. Instead of portraying through precise, realistic detail, they used personal metaphors and symbols, evoking a meaning or feeling instead. It rejected reality and daily life and offered an escape into the world of dreams and visions, spiritualism and mythology. They filled their works with spiritual value and produced imaginary dream worlds populated with mysterious figures from biblical stories and Greek mythology, as well as fantastical or monstrous creatures. Many French painters followed the lead of the symbolist writers, including Gustave Moreau, Pierre Pouvy de Chavannes, and Odilon Redon. They were the forerunners of symbolism. Symbolism had a significant reach beyond France, with artists such as Edvard Munch in Norway and Gustav Klimt in Austria. In Scotland, there were a few artists besides Duncan associated with the movement. Symbolism and Art Nouveau developed around the same time, and works by Redon, Klimt, and Aubrey Beardsley show the influence and awareness of multiple styles. The suggestive imagery of the symbolist painters established what would become the most pervasive themes in symbolist art. Love, fear, anguish, death, sexual awakening, and unrequited desire. Woman quickly became the perfect symbol that artists used to portray these universal emotions, and she appeared both as the virgin and as the menacing femme fatale. These two mythical female types later became cultural staples and appeared often in both art and literature from the 1880s through the first decades of the 20th century. Duncan was born in Dundee in Scotland in 1866. Although he was the son of a butcher and cattleman, he had no interest in the family business and was a born artist by nature. From the age of 11, he trained at the nascent Dundee School of Art. Duncan started work as an illustrator there by the age of 14. By 15, he was submitting cartoons to the local magazine, The Wizard of the North. He was then taken on as an assistant in the art department of the Dundee Advertiser, while he was also a student at the Dundee School of Art. 
As a young man, he shared an interest in Celtic language and culture with his friend William A. Craigie, who went on to become a distinguished philologist. In 1887 to 1888, he took his skills to London to work as a commercial illustrator. Then in 1890, he traveled to the continent to study painting at Antwerp Academy and the Dusseldorf Art Academy. Later that year, he went on an extended trip to Italy, studying in Rome, which opened his eyes to the beautiful paintings of Botticelli and Fra Angelico, and to the possibilities of tempera as a medium. The early Renaissance Italian artist made a huge and lasting impression on him. In 1889, he returned to Dundee and exhibited his art in galleries, and the following year he became one of the founding members of the Dundee Graphic Arts Association. A few years later, he moved to Edinburgh, to work with the Celtic revival leader and sociologist, botanist, and urbanist Patrick Geddes. Duncan helped a lot with one of his primary activities that focused on an area of dilapidated buildings in the upper part of the old town of Edinburgh, which Geddes was converting into student residences, family accommodation, and places of study. By 1893, he was designing murals, about which he consulted his friend Craigie, these were designed for the Geddes family apartment in the newly built Arts and Crafts condominium of Ramsey Garden. That mural scheme, now lost, consisted of panels showing the evolution of pipe music. Duncan painted murals for Geddes' halls of residence at Ramsey Garden as part of the Celtic revival movement. He also became the principal artist for Geddes' 1895-1897 seasonal magazine The Evergreen. The graphic quality of his art made him an ideal contributor to the Evergreen, and he was nurtured by the strong journalism-related visual culture of his native city. He also was the director of Geddes' short-lived Old Edinburgh School of Art, and was commissioned by him to design The Witch's Well in Edinburgh of 1894. In 1897, Duncan returned to Dundee and exhibited Celtic and Symbolist paintings at the Graphic Arts Association, as well as at the Royal Scottish Academy and the Royal Glasgow Institute. Let's now go through his paintings, highlighting the mythological subjects, beginning with this one. This is Aoife, the female warrior of Celtic mythology. The waterfall in the background echoes her harsh blue eyes, ripe with passion and sharp perception, which shows the entranced, spellbound quality of Symbolist art. Yet this piece seems to go way beyond it in its grandeur, mixing it with the grand goddess-like depiction of pre-Raphaelite art. Saint Bride, painted in 1913. This painting I actually saw in person in Scotland without knowing the painter. I was so entranced by it, the vivid colors and the intricate quilt-like design. It seemed to me almost like a pre-Raphaelite tapestry, where the robes are also their own tapestries. The lack of perspective and the two-dimensionality of the composition, as well as the stained glass-like quality of the angel's robes, make it look almost medieval. It depicts the legend of the Irish Saint Bride being held aloft by a couple of angels, as she was miraculously transported to Bethlehem to attend the Nativity of Christ. In this work, Duncan's love of the Irish illuminated manuscripts is directly evident. The robes of the angels are richly decorated with Celtic knotwork, and the colors are matched to the five major pigments used by the monks in the Book of Kells. The Riders of the She I'm going to read a quote here to explain this painting. The quote is by Anna Robertson, fine and applied art manager in Dundee, Scotland, who wrote so beautifully about this painting. The Riders of the She is a John Duncan masterpiece. It is an iconic image of the late 19th century Celtic revival, a movement that evoked the ancient cultural identities of Scotland and Ireland. In Celtic myth, the she are fairy folk. They are shown in procession, riding out on the May festival of Beltane, to initiate mortals into their faith. Duncan intended the pose and expression of each rider to reflect the qualities of the Celtic symbol they carry. From left to right, the tree of life denotes wisdom, the grail cup love, the sword symbolizes strength and power, and the stone or crystal of quietness is hope, as it reflects the past and the future. Duncan's talent was to blend many sources to create a modern depiction of an ancient culture. The sword has similarities to Bronze Age examples. We know that he studied illustrations from museum collections. The painting also reveals Duncan's study of Italian Renaissance artists, 
and he acknowledged the drapery of Edward Byrne Jones as an inspiration. One of his most famous works is Tristan and Isolde, painted in 1912. This painting illustrates the Irish myth of Tristan and Isolde, which tells the story of a young man who brought a young woman to Ireland so that she could marry his uncle the king, but during the journey the two of them instead fall in love after drinking a love potion, which has disastrous results. The painting is done in the style of the pre-Raphaelite painters, but if you look closely, you can see that the work also includes the distinctive Celtic patterns in the embroidery of Tristan's costume and in the carvings of the boat. It might look familiar if you saw my Viking art videos. My interpretation of this painting is that the bright colors, the regal dress, as well as the intricate patterns all over the canvas, and especially the typified perfection of the mythical archetypes, strikes something so deep inside us which feels invigorating and romantic, while at the same time, the frowns and the seriousness of the facial expression seem ominous and tired, fitting the romantic and the pre-Raphaelite style a sort of vague sense of impending darkness of the future which came from the decadent art of this time. Angus Og, God of Love and Courtesy, Putting a Spell of Summer Calm on the Sea, painted in 1908. In Celtic mythology, Angus Og is the god of youth, love, and poetic inspiration. Traditionally described as having singing birds circling his head, Duncan depicts him with wings of a swan, you can see here how influenced he is by the classical and romantic artistic tradition. The Messenger of Tethra, 1910 Speaking of this flat, graphic quality of his art, let's look at this painting. It depicts a woman from the story of Tethra, a king in Irish Celtic mythology, who sent beautiful women as messengers to entice princes. You can see in her hand she's holding a branch. This is a branch of the singing tree in which three birds perch, if the branch is laid on someone's pillow, it would wake them up and force them to follow the messenger back to Tethra. The singing tree also acted as a talisman, enabling a living person to enter the other world safely. In terms of the composition, you can see how just like in the Pre-Raphaelite and Renaissance tradition, she looks frozen in her frame like a cutout. There's no movement or much spiritual life in the portrait, because that technique came later in the Baroque period. This is the subject of Heinrich Wolflin's famous theory in art history about the five dichotomies that differentiate Renaissance and Baroque styles. There is very little dimensionality in this picture, it almost looks more flat, less lifelike. Although there is foreground and background, as per the Renaissance tradition, there is no recession into the background. Celtic head. Contrast this head stylistically with a Tethra painting. How different they are, in that this one actually does what I was just saying the other did not. There's a strong use of shadows and emotional shock and feeling. The background simply fades into darkness, and there isn't much in this picture in terms of detail, besides the snapshot of a moment. How different this painting is from most of his others, because of his use of depth and lack of a defined silhouette. Merlin and the Fairy Queen The subject here comes from an English epic poem by Edmund Spencer called The Fairy Queen, published between 1590 and 1596, it's one of the longest poems in the English language. In terms of the structure, the poem follows several nights as a way to examine different virtues, therefore the text is primarily an allegorical work which can be read on several levels of allegory. In this painting, the fairy queen's body looks frozen, almost like she appeared there suddenly in that one second. Her eyes are glazed over, her face looks ghost-like. This is a clear instance of symbolism the entranced look on her face and how concerned Merlin is with her and this magical quality that she has. Also note the background, how vague and illusory it looks, making the whole scene even more fantastical and dreamlike. The focus is clearly on the sharply delineated two figures in the foreground, the same way that we can't recall a full picture from our dreams, but only certain important things. This is the essence of symbolism. The Children of Lear, 1914 the Children of Lear is another legend from Irish mythology. It's actually a tale from the post-Christianized period and mixes magical elements like druidic wands and spells with a Christian message of Christian faith bringing freedom from suffering. In the scholarship after the 18th century, the tale has often been grouped with three others, translated in English from the original Irish as The Fate of the Children of Ishnach, The Fate of the Children of Tyrann, and The Three Sorrows of Storytelling, also known as The Three Sorrowful Tales of Erin. 
Manuscripts containing early versions of these tales are at the National Library of Scotland, the British Library, and at the Library of the Royal Irish Academy. It's a beautiful, pure picture that seems clearly Renaissance-influenced, with the body of the adult woman looking so much like Botticelli's Venus, and her facial structure as well. Ivory, Apes, and Peacocks, painted in 1923. This painting depicts the famous Queen of Sheba, mentioned in the Old Testament in relation to King Solomon, whose court she visited. This moment is told in the first book of Kings, chapter 10. Quote, and when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold. The title of this painting takes its name from verse 22. For the king had at sea a navy of Tharnish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tharnish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. Duncan was probably familiar with the many literary interpretations of the theme of the Queen of Sheba, like in the poetry of John Masefield, and also some artistic depictions like the huge history painting by Sir Edward John Poynter, The Queen of Sheba's Visit to King Solomon, from 1882. Duncan uses the same slender paper cutout style for the figures, which seem almost Egyptian-like in their flat depiction and profile view, except for some of the tilted heads which come from the pre-Raphaelite style. This painting is like a mirage of fantastical colorful pieces juxtaposed together. Each one looks totally alone, and doesn't blend in with the other figures. Yurinda and Yuringel in the Witch's Wood, 1909 this is a pretty early work, although his style is already fully formed. It illustrates the Grimm's fairy tale of the same name, which tells how two lovers wander into a wood where a witch turns the girl, Yorinda, into a nightingale and carries her off to her castle. Yorinjel eventually rescues her with the aid of a magic flower. This one might be one of his most beautiful paintings, and one of my favorite paintings ever. The symbolism and lack of a concrete world makes it intoxicating and sensory, like a dream you just can't and won't awake from. Each part of the design is different and very complex, both in terms of the style and the meaning evoked, and although there isn't a perfect typical form of compositional harmony, there is still harmony, balance, and proportion in the picture. Like the perfect circle of fairies surrounding the lovers, and then a diagonal line of more fairies going up into the top right corner of the frame, while something with totally different energy brews in the bottom right hand corner. You can feel the isolation of the lovers who are so unaware of anything outside of their bubble, and the way time and space seem to melt together. Again, a perfect example of symbolism. The Three Magi, 1915. This is one of Duncan's Christian-inspired paintings. You can feel both the Renaissance and pre-Raphaelite feeling here. This painting is called, According to Your Faith, Be It Unto You. This one looks a lot like an old Renaissance painting by Fra Angelico except the faces are mean and angular, like in romantic art, and there's a vague sense of mysticism and witchy energy and foreboding, typical of symbolism. The gesture doesn't seem warm and benevolent as it would in Renaissance art, but instead seems like a dark spell being cast. The figure kneeling looks totally powerless and afraid, and isn't self-contained or at peace at all. And the standing figure looks angry and powerful, inflicting harm onto the other. It's also impossible to ignore the straightness and angularity of the robe, which comes directly from pre-Raphaelite art and the clothing of the aesthetic movement, which was alive during the 1880s and 90s. This next one is called The Venus That Was Never Finished, painted during the years of 1910 to 1920. You can see how this Venus looks like a Renaissance Venus, except again the sharpness of the face and intensity and drama of the expression comes straight from Romanticism and symbolism. Although, you could say it's still a reawakening of the drama and intensity of Italian faces from the Renaissance and Baroque eras. Heptu bidding farewell to the city of Ob, 1909. This is another one of those paintings that provide a link between 19th century art and 20th century fantasy illustration. I couldn't find anything about the subject of this painting, it seems to be completely made up by the artist himself. The beast looks half eagle, half horse. I love this picture, the long expanse of all blue, and the way that Duncan chose to portray the subject so high up in the sky, very vertically, conveys a really realistic sense of space and freedom. You can clearly see from the detail of the woman on the beast that she's in the foreground and up close, 
almost as if this picture was a snapshot by a camera or a drone that flew all the way up with them thousands of feet in the air within a few seconds as she quickly leaves the land of the city of Ob. Hymn to the Rose, 1907. This one seems to me like one of his most pre-Raphaelite paintings. Head of a Goddess. This painting I love, possibly the most out of all, and I don't even know anything about it, where this kind of headdress comes from. It seems so angular, yet realistic and filled with feeling, something he does so well. I love how John Duncan uses pattern in an independent, free way in his paintings to add a new dimension. It's almost a perfect blend of realism and abstract, quilt-like pattern, which makes his work so appealing for everyone. He had free license to do this as he abandoned pure realism and leapt into the world of fantasy, fairy tale drawing, and the sort of organic, ethnic, folkloric Art Nouveau style from the Celtic revival and people like William Morris. Ultimately, I think John Duncan was a fascinating artist whose styles never ceased to show his wide range of artistic feeling. He's one of the few artists I've seen who seems so elastic and moved by many different subjects and currents, both of the past and of his own time.